thanks to CuriosityStream and Nebula for sponsoring this video. Let me start by saying that generally individuals don't matter in the history of science. The history of science is a history of big social and economic and technological factors. Though, of course, sometimes an individual does arise out of that big picture. People like Einstein, James Clerk Maxwell. But those individuals normally follow a pattern. They're from a wealthy background. Their family normally has some kind of training in or connection to science. Fairy tale, rags to riches stories just don't exist. Except, of course, sometimes. Very rarely, they do. Like the janitor turned international scientist, James Kroll. But before telling you his story, let me set the scene. It's the 19th century. Science as we know it is in the process of being born. In particular, scientists are starting to realise that our planet looked very different in the past. Geologists are uncovering evidence that snow and ice had previously, thousands of years ago, covered all of Europe in what was being called the Ice Age. At the time, the scientific consensus was that the Earth was still gradually cooling from its formation, so this idea of the Earth being colder in the past was quite revolutionary. The question of how the Earth could have a period of intense cold in its deep past was an open one. It was largely investigated at institutions like universities and scientific societies like the Royal Society in London. These institutions often trace back their roots for hundreds of years, but it was really in the 19th century that they became the place to do research. That meant that if you couldn't get access to one of these institutions, then you were largely shut out from cutting-edge research. One such institution was the Andersonian University in Glasgow, which is now part of Strathclyde University. And in 1859, it got a new janitor. James Kroll was born in 1821 to a very poor crofting family in Perthshire in Scotland, and he was born with the front part of his skull not properly formed, and he'd be plagued by this disability and general ill health for his entire life. When he was old enough to go to school, he actually refused to go initially because he was worried that the other children would laugh at him for the unusual shape of his head. He didn't go for several years, and when he eventually did go, and hated it, it was only a couple of years before the family called him back to work on the farm because they were struggling to make ends meet. All this is to say that he ended up being largely self-educated, and in particular, a magazine, namely the Penny Magazine of the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge, WOW, sparked an interest in Kroll in science. Unfortunately though, there was no way for Kroll to follow up on this interest, because he was very poor, and there were no opportunities for very poor people to get further education. But his meagre source of income, the family farm, eventually became unsustainable, and he had to leave to get another job. And for several years, Kroll scraped by working whatever job he could. He was a joiner, he worked on a newspaper, he sold insurance, he ran a hotel. But in all of these things, he was incredibly unlucky. Things just kept happening to him that meant he had to leave his jobs. Often it was his physical health that would just fail him, and he'd have to leave and find something new. By 1859, Kroll is nearly 40, he's desperately poor, he's struggling to feed himself and now his wife, and he's constantly unwell, he's physically frail, having been kicked from job to job to job. He has this dream of following science, but no way to make that dream a reality. But he gets the break of a lifetime when he lands a job as a janitor. He's paid one pound a week to clean the library at the Andersonian University. Well, actually him and his brother are paid to clean the library, and it's unclear how much of the cleaning James actually did. Because inspired by years of reading the Penny magazine, Kroll took this opportunity to devour the contents of the library. He taught himself the latest theories in mathematics and physics and geology and astronomy, and eventually started corresponding with the authors of those theories. Not fan mail, but critiquing their work, and he engaged in a level playing field intellectual debate with people like Charles Darwin, and Lord Kelvin, and John Tyndall, and it became clear that all along, Kroll had this unbelievable mind. The thing that he seemed particularly interested in, though, was the cause of this newly discovered Ice Age. And he thought, presumably while sweeping the floor or cleaning windows, that the French mathematician Joseph Adhemar was on the right lines when he suggested that variations in the Earth's orbit around the Sun were responsible for the Ice Age. 
Because the Earth's orbit isn't exactly circular, it's elliptical, or a squashed circle. You may recall that the Earth is also tilted in its orbit, meaning that one hemisphere is more exposed to the Sun for half the year than the other, causing the seasons. Now, Adema argued that if the Northern Hemisphere's summer corresponded with when the Earth was closest in its elliptical orbit to the Sun, its summer would be particularly hot and its winter particularly cold. And vice versa, the Southern Hemisphere's summer would be colder and its winter warmer. As the Earth goes around the Sun over and over again though, the direction its axis points in changes very slowly, and eventually those roles will be flipped, with the Southern Hemisphere having hotter summers and colder winters, its summer lining up with the closest approach of the Earth to the Sun, and of course the opposite for the Northern Hemisphere. This changing of roles happens on a regular cycle that's tens of thousands of years long, and it's also moderated and varied by several other complicated bits of orbital mechanics. Kroll hypothesized that this orbital variation was responsible for the Ice Age. He claimed that when a hemisphere's winter was particularly cold, more snow would fall, and so over hundreds and thousands of years that snow would be compacted into ice sheets that would cover the landscape. An ice age. Crucially, he also realised that the more snow that falls on the ground and the more ice that forms in the sea, the more reflective the Earth becomes, reducing the amount of energy that it absorbs from the sun, cooling it even further, cooling an already cooler Earth that would then lead to more snow, that would then lead to more reflection, and even more cooling, and so on. What we would today call a positive ice albedo feedback loop. So those orbital variations didn't even need to be that big in order to produce huge changes in climate, enough to cause ice ages. Yes, ice ages plural. Kroll figured that this was a regular cycle, and so it would cause regular ice ages, despite the fact there was no evidence at that time for that being the case but he trusted his maths. This theory was fantastic, it was truly brilliant, and Kroll was acclaimed by the great scientists of his day, people like Darwin. But unfortunately, there was no way to know if he was right or not. The experimental techniques to prove or disprove his theories hadn't even been imagined yet. Regardless, Kroll was given an official academic post, allowing him to hang up his broom. And for the first time in his life, he was able to live comfortably, because He'd made it. He'd made it to the inner echelons of science, to one of these institutions where research was done, and he was accepted and respected by his peers. But sadly, this wasn't to last. After a brief, hard-won career in academia, Kroll's health failed him again, and he felt compelled to resign, and in fact, retire, in poverty once more until his death. And while he was lauded in his lifetime, within a few decades of his death he'd been mostly forgotten, as had his theory. In fact, the few academics who did remember the theory basically dismissed it out of hand. Until a far more famous name in this field came along, the Serbian Milutin Milankovic. Milankovic extended Kroll's mathematics and corrected a mistake in them, because it's actually summers being colder when the summer hemisphere is further from the sun that prevents ice melt that leads to an ice age, not winters being even colder. And because of these developments, the theory became known as Milankovic cycles. And when eventually, in the 1970s, techniques were invented that could establish past temperatures from ocean sediment cores, it was Milankovic's theory that was proven correct. His mathematics neatly lined up with a bunch of ice ages throughout Earth's history. And so it's his name, not unjustly, that was associated with this theory that variations in the Earth's orbit around the Sun forced its climate. But perhaps we should be calling them Kroll Milankovic cycles, because James Kroll laid the foundations of the theory, and he made the crucial realization that feedback loops on Earth would amplify any forcing from orbital variations. His genius was recognized in his lifetime. One obituary claimed, Every honest scientific investigator will admit that Kroll's writings have had the most radical influence on cosmological speculation. In certain directions, his influence has been nearly as great as that of Darwin's in biology. None of this is to take away from Milankovic's work, which was also brilliant. All I'm saying is that I think James Kroll should be better known. He's one of the thousands of men and women throughout history who were links in the chain of scientific knowledge, but weren't the last link, and so 
just haven't been remembered. He overcame incredible odds and swam against the tides of economics and social mobility of the time to become one of these remarkable men, one of these incredible stories, a fairy tale in the history of science. May I present to you possibly the greatest janitor the world has ever known, James Kroll. Remember him. The story of the Earth is a dramatic one. It's a story of ice and fire and collisions and creation and destruction. The very ground beneath my feet right now is only here because of hundreds of millions of years of violence. It's a story told in 300 million years. Actually, it's more like an hour and a half. A documentary on the formation of the continent of Europe, one of the thousands of documentaries on CuriosityStream. If you fancy expanding your horizons with expertly crafted and curated documentaries on your lunch breaks or in the evenings, CuriosityStream is perfect for you. Rather than re-watching Friends again, why not learn about Kurdistan or African art or coffee or bees? Or perhaps you'd prefer something indie like this video. Perhaps you'd like to watch more videos like this without any adverts in them at all from a variety of educational content creators Perhaps you'd even like to watch exclusive content like Lindsay Ellis analysing how Tropic Thunder changed Hollywood. Well, you're in luck, because that's Nebula, the thoughtful educational streaming platform that's partnered up with CuriosityStream. If you go to curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark, you get access to the best of both worlds, the high production value documentaries on CuriosityStream and the indie videos on Nebula. And better yet, with this bundle, you get a 26% discount on a subscription to CuriosityStream, less than $15 a year. But that's not all. With this bundle, you directly support educational creators like me, and you help support the development of online educational video by allowing creators like me to take risks and do things that aren't necessarily algorithm friendly. That's curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark to access both CuriosityStream and Nebula, and get that 26% discount. Thanks to all of you who have already signed up to this bundle, and thank you to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. I found out about Kroll when I was researching my book. You can pre-order it now, link in the description. And as soon as I heard his story, I just knew that I had to make a video about him and his incredible life story. If you'd like to learn more details about his life, then please do check out this fantastic talk by Mike Robinson of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society, which goes into way more detail than I could fit into this video, and it was a really useful resource for putting together the video. If you'd like to watch some more stuff by me, then here's some recommended viewing next. If you did enjoy the video, please do pop it a like, and share it with people that you think might find it interesting as well. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.